both people are here. Charles Moskovich, you're on the screen right now. How's it going, sir? Good, fine, thanks. Good to see you. Very good to see you as well. Captain, you're here too. How you doing, man? I'm doing pretty good today. How you doing, Ralph? I'm doing great, man. It's good to see you as well. Oh, man, always good. It's always good. Always good to see the captain on the kill stream. <laughs> now, uh, okay, so, Charles, you've not done one of these debates on the kill stream, so I'll kind of lay it out. What I usually do is let each person talk really like a max of 10 minutes, you know, five to 10 minutes. I, I don't put a clock on it, but if it goes really long, I might say, hey, you know, wrap it at the start uh, to give their their – opening statement and then after that it's kind of just back and forth between the two participants and i may interrupt here and there with a question or to stop you guys talking over each other but for the most part it's a participant driven um debate right because i just feel like those are more entertaining um but i, I will step in here or there uh or if i feel like i need to um if you got to start talking over each other a ton or, or whatever. Uh, but that's kind of how I do it. Mostly hands off. Uh, that's, that's how we do it here on the kill stream, but I'll let, uh, I'll let you start. Now, the, again, I'll remind people and we could get off into some other stuff too, but the topic of the debate is actually Gaza and whether or not Israel is perpetra perpetrating a genocide, uh, in Gaza. And so, would you like to start, Charles, or would you like Captain to start? I had in my in my mind that you would start, but it's up to either if you if you want him to start. I'd be happy to start. That's okay. Fine. Okay, go ahead. I'll let you start. All right. Thanks so much, uh, Ethan and Captain. Mm -hmm. um, I would argue that Israel is not engaging in any kind of a genocide in Gaza. Let's give a little historic background. In 1995, Israel withdrew from Gaza completely under the government of Ariel Sharon, who was a pretty hawkish uh, prime minister of Israel. Not only did they completely withdraw, but they also stripped away all of the Jewish residents of Gaza, about 10,000 people, in some cases at gunpoint. They didn't want to leave. They helped the Palestinian Authority develop a, a, a police force, a security force. Money was pouring into Gaza from all over the world, including the United States. Gaza is not a poor place, as anyone can see from pictures of the city. It's beachfront property, and it's a, it's a, there's a lot going on there. The Palestinian Authority and the people of Gaza had the opportunity to turn Gaza into what could have been described as like a Singapore or a Hong Kong. I mean, they had every opportunity to do this. And Israel was offering more. They had also withdrawn at the time, which is lesser known, from Jericho, and they were talking about withdrawing from other parts of Judea and Samaria. Um, Israel asked nothing in return other than one simple expectation, and that was that they hoped that they would have a peaceful border there um, so that the people of Israel could continue with their farms and their, their villages and live in peace. But unfortunately, about two years afterwards, Hamas was elected they took over Gaza as a dictatorship and they basically killed hundreds of Palestinian Authority people. And they began to launch a war against Israel. They launched something like in the vicinity of 6,000 missiles into Israel. They began to build this incredible tunnel network that we're now discovering, including tunnels into Israel, where they would come out and try to kill as many Jews and Israelis as possible. And um, every time Israel would try to get a ceasefire, they would immediately start firing again. They didn't even pay any attention to the ceasefires. And this continued for years, and it, it, it got more creative in that they started to float gas balloons into Israel to burn the fields and try every kind of terror they could try. They, there was a huge shipment of arms and um, munitions from Iran and called the Karine A that the Israeli Navy intercepted. So they had to put up a blockade. Eventually, of course, the final straw was the October 6th attack, the so-called flood, which had been initially, originally patented by Soleimani, in which they just flooded into Israel and slaughtered as many people as they could, raping women, killing every person they could reach, 
at that music festival and also in several villages alongside the border. And so I would argue that Israel, acting like any sane sovereign state, has a right to defend the lives and the property of its own people. In fact, to do otherwise, you would forfeit the right to be a sovereign state. So Israel is now in the process of getting rid of these forces that are trying to kill them. Now, I don't think that they're trying to do a genocide. They're not trying to kill innocent people. The problem is it's very complicated. The combatants in Hamas put on civilian clothes, even though they have military gear, and they hide behind innocent people. They hide behind families. And so Israel has to go through the very difficult process of trying to find them and to try to find the tunnels and find the, um, the, the, the missile launchers and find the military sites amongst the civilian population. I would argue that it's a difficult job and they are doing it as best they can under the circumstances. Go ahead, Captain. No problem. I think you meant 2005, not 1995. Am I correct? No, 1995 was the year that, oh, no, yeah. Thank, yeah, it was too thank you know, you know, I was looking it up when you said that, and I didn't see 1995. Yeah, I, I, you're right. I meant 2000. Right. And uh, in 2007, when I look up the history, um, the part that you're missing um, um, after Hamas, when they seized it, it was like Israel, Israel put up a blockade. But when you mention history, one would also argue that you can't go to 2005 history. You would have to go to the history of, uh, you would act, say, before y'all got there. So if you're talking about, let's say, in the early 1900s, um, when y'all first got there, one would argue that the Palestinians being displaced when they were promised not to be displaced, when they were promised not to lose their religion, when they was promised not to lose their way of life, only to lose it. And initially, there was a limit of how many immigrants could come into the land with the bell for that. So one, one could say that your breaking of the rules is the actual cause of the conflict. Now, me, myself, personally, I don't care for either party, but I can't judge a matter. What I mean by say care, I don't care for either party, like um, the land really belongs to the children of Israel. That's a conversation maybe we can get to at some point. Yes. Uh, obviously, we believe differently who the children of Israel are. Um, probably. Probably, okay, no problem. We'll see. Right. So um, when we talk about history, historically, it was colonialism that you guys went to imply on the Palestinians that has caused this never ending war. So when you say genocide, when we look at the numbers of deaths, it wouldn't even be comparable with the deaths of the Palestinian or the Ara Arabian people as opposed to your people. You can also argue that the Palestinians invited you in. I can play a video if you want to see where y'all came in on the boat. In like 1935, y'all come in on the boat and like, don't hurt us like the Germans hurt us. And they bought y'all in. And then when they bought y'all in, y'all began to eradicate them. So you would be the cause of their fight or of their plight. It's like if I'm trying to come in and destroy your home and live in your home and you're fighting me in my home, you're not wrong for retaliating against me because I'm invading your home. So you guys are invading their home and then get mad when they fight back. That's that's how I look at it as an outsider that have nothing invested in Israeli people or Palestinian people being able to look at it objectively. I would say that you guys are genociding and you won't stop until even and I'll, I'll end on this. Um, what's what's your what's your current prime minister's name? I don't want to mess up the Hebrew. Benjamin Netanyahu. Netanyahu. Yeah, Netanyahu. Netanyahu, right? Mm -hmm. Netanyahu made a point to say that we're going to remember them like Amalek. Right, you mm -hmm. that statement. You know, when Amalek did what they did, what they did was Amalek purposely targeted the weak and the elderly. Exactly. Right, and so that's the reason that the Lord told King Saul to get vengeance on them. That's right. The Palestinians aren't going after the weak and elderly. Y'all are in reverse because it's like thirty something. They did thousand. on October eighth. I don't mean to interrupt here, but that's exactly what they did. Well, y'all, when, when we look at the death tolls right now, y'all are at, they are at 30,000 dead. Mm -hmm. Israelis, According to Hamas, by the way. It, the Israelis uh, hypothesize that 10,000 of those are military. Right. So that would be 20,000 
civilians. Y'all are only at like what fourteen hundred. Well, I mean, so first you, of all, I mean, you also have to factor in how many of the Palestinians have been killed by Hamas itself because they keep misfiring their missiles and they keep killing people that they suspect as traitors, like these 30 people that were found dead in, in black plastic bags. That sounds but, like um, candor, but I want to ask my question. If you take, yeah. if, if I, if I, if it's 30,000 and I minus the 10,000 that they say are military, which you could say the military signed up for it. So if you got 20,000 compared to 1,400, what's this genocide side? Is it the Palestinians are being genocide or are the Israelis? Well, let me ask you a question. Do you think wait, that- Wait, 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 you gotta answer my question first though. I, I will with a question. Oh, okay. in, in typical Jewish fashion, okay? Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, Which is, that's, <laughs> you know, it's like yeah, a yeah, yeah, he ain't gonna answer it. Well, you no, know, the, I'll answer it the, here. You know, I, I'll give you my answer in the form of a question. Right. Do you think that Israel and the IDF is deliberately and consciously trying to kill innocent people? Yes. Okay, well, I disagree with you. I think they're trying to kill combatants, and the combatants are hiding behind innocent people. Israel's not trying to kill women and children. They never, they, they, why would they do that? When they destroy hospitals with uh, women and children. With, not with, with uh, terror tunnels underneath, and with uh, they finding all these you know, munitions in the hospitals. Why are the why is Hamas okay. building at a hospital? Think about what you just said. Okay. I said. I said is destroying hospitals with women and children. You just gave me an excuse to kill I'm women. I'm explaining and why they had to do it. I'm not saying, I'm not saying That's where the head military headquarters is. Just listen, just listen to yeah. what I'm saying. They are killing innocents. You trying to say I'm trying not, to say they're trying to avoid that when possible, but when you put oh, a, a bomb Right. If they if you put the weapons where the hospital is at, they're yeah. gonna say they're gonna say, F these kids, F these women, we're gonna bomb the hospital. No, you have to ask why is it the F F the children and women that Hamas is putting bombs next to their beds? Why are they using hospitals as a place to set up a military base? Right. Why are they using orphanages? Did they, find, they find the weapons there? Yes, they have found weapons there, according yeah. to any international uh, observers. They have found oh, massive yeah. weapons there, and they found tunnels and headquarters tunnels right are, underneath tunnels these anywhere. rooms. Tunnels. Yes, they have. Yeah, tunnels is anywhere, and I don't think you're in a no, position. No, no, no. The headquarters was found at that hospital you're talking all, about. All I was going to say, when it comes to tunnels, I don't know if you want to talk about tunnels because the Jewish people had that tunnel out here. So y'all just as good at tunnels as the uh, Palestinians. Were they using it to kill people? They was using it to do all types of... You're talking about the Chabad tunnel in yeah. New York. That has nothing to do with Israel. It, that it, has everything. Were they not Jewish? Yeah, but it, they were not. They're Americans. They're not Israelis. They, they're building that to in order to have a mikvah and in order to these kids, these hooligans, these Chabad hooligans, were using they're it as bad, the bad Jewish people. No, that that that's a nothing burger. But to get back to your history, no, not the history. I want to address that Wait, one at a time. Hold on, not the history part. I don't mind the history part. But just on the record, if there's weapons at a hospital and there's women and children there, you're going to kill the women and children. You try your best not to, but you have to get the military. That's a yes or no. That's a yes or no. Yes, you are, but you have to try not to. And you can't say that you're not. I'm not saying that innocent people aren't being killed. I'm explaining yeah, why. Population is genocide. No, genocide is if you deliberately and consciously try to kill people based upon their ethnic background. That is deliberate. The you deliberate. No, it's actually Israelis. The Israeli army and the soldiers are putting their lives at risk. You know what's not deliberate? If they blow up a warehouse, then they find out that women and children was in the warehouse. Yeah, I'll tell you what. You know what would be what they're doing is you're counting the cost. You say it's better to kill the women and children to get these supposed weapons out of here than to leave these women and children alive, and then they take these weapons and use them on us. That's your hypothesis. Look, so if Israel really wanted to kill women and children, they could drop a big fat bomb on the whole place. But instead, they have soldiers have to go there and get killed themselves to try to find their enemies' rocket launchers, which are being used to kill Israelis. So the question is, why are they putting rocket launchers and building terror tunnels underneath civilian locations in violation of all standards of international law and custom? That's a good question. Yeah. It, goes, it goes right back to your, your forced occupancy of Palestine. Israel wasn't occupying Gaza. Israel, no, no. I just explained in the beginning, Israel completely... No, that what I'm talking, that, that's not what I'm talking about. You're talking about Gaza. That's the subject here. No, no, no. What I mean is when um 
when we talk about the history, like when we're talking about Gaza, you only withdrew, it says from 2005 to 2006. No one on this live stream is going to believe that all of Israel can withdraw in a year. No one's going to believe that. From Gaza? Yeah. But they, but they did. No, completely. no not, not completely. No one yes, they completely. did. Completely. 100%. No. Israel completely withdrew from Gaza, and Gaza had the opportunity to create a responsible state that would have been sovereign and they could have existed peacefully alongside Israel. Instead, they chose to invade Israel. That's the facts. Those are history. No, that's, that's the not, history. That's, yes, not, but that's not the history of Palestine because it no, came, but it's the history of Gaza. But I'll talk about Palestine. Where, 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 on, where, let, where, let Captain get in, and I'll let you get back in, Charles. Go ahead, Captain. Gaza and Palestine or Israel? Well, Palestine, first of all, I would argue that Palestine is Israel. But but I'm going to ask you, is Gaza in Palestine or Israel? Well, right now, right now, I think it's pretty much in Israel because they've occupied. They've had to reoccupy it, unfortunately, which they did not want to do. And then Israel itself, was that at one time Palestine before 48? Yes, it was Jewish Palestine. Yes, it was. No, it was all it was just all Palestine. It didn't get divided, right? Well, it got divided in 1921 between Jewish Palestine and Arab Palestine, or what's called Cisjordan and Transjordan. Transjordan eventually became the, the Arab Kingdom of Jordan, and Cisjordan eventually became the Jewish State of Israel. So Palestine was divided at that time. Right. And how was it divided? It was divided along the Jordan River with the West Part. No, no, no. Oh, what I'm asking you. When I say how was it divided, was it divided like the Palestinians wanted to divide or they did not want to divide? Were they promised that it was going to be okay to uh, have it divided? Like, that's what I'm asking. That's the history that I'm talking about. Well, it's okay. Let me address the entire history here. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, first of all, the Jews didn't just show up in, in that miserable little strip of land that we now know as Israel. Um, I get into this in my book, The Anti-Semitic Imagination. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, where I point out that Jews have always lived there, especially in the cities, that Zionism is a movement that is nothing more and nothing less than the national and religious aspirations of the Jewish people, that every generation from the time of the destruction of the temple right up to independence in 1948 has seen Jews trying to reassert their sovereignty in their homeland. And I get into this year by year, decade by decade in my new book, The Anti-Semitic Imagination. Those are facts of history. As far as Arabs in Palestine go, and the word Palestine, by the way, traces back to the Roman times. The Roman Emperor Hadrian named it Palestine after he destroyed Jerusalem after the Bar Kokhba rebellion because he figured the Jewish people are finished, they're over. So he renamed it after their worst enemy, which was the Philistines. That's where the word Palestine comes from. Although more recent scholars say that the word Palestine actually is a, is a derivative from the word Judea. And I think there might be some truth to that. But either way, every generation has seen the Jewish people trying to go back there and to reassert their sovereignty. They really started to immigrate in, in larger numbers after, 19, after 1800 and when Napoleon briefly occupied the region from the Turks, it had been under control of the Turks. At that time, it was known as South Syria. After World War I, the British and the French divided up the region and they betrayed the Arabs when they did that. And they gave the British section to the, the Jewish people after the signing of the Balfour Declaration. Now, what's not known about that is that at the same time, the Arab head of state, um, King, Hussein, King Faisal bin Hussein, who is recognized as the main figure in the Arab world, he's a direct descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, he signed an agreement with the head of the World Zionist Organization, recognizing Israel, Jewish Palestine in 1917, February 6th of 1917. It was, or 1918, I'm sorry. It was part of the Paris Peace Agreement that ended World War I. And the reason he did it was because he could see that the Jewish people who were immigrating into Palestine at the time were creating this incredible, dynamic, organic society where they were growing crops and they were building businesses and they were developing democracy and developing technology. And he wanted the same thing for his Arab countries after World War I. 
And so he figured that by uh, this nationalist movement would work hand in glove with Arab nationalist movements. And together they would develop sovereignty. At the time he wrote a letter to Felix Frankfurter, who was the president of Harvard Law School and who's a major Jewish Zionist figure, saying, I want to welcome our cousins home to their homeland. I want to give you a hearty welcome home. And the attitude amongst a lot of Arabs at that time was that they could coexist with this new state as long as Israel reached two conditions, which they've met. The first is that they would respect the rights of the Arab minority. And the, and the second was that they would respect the sacredness of Islamic holy sites. Israel has done that. They haven't done it perfectly, but they've tried to do it and they've basically done that. The problem is that there was a more radical element within the Arab world that overtook King Faisal and launched a war against the newly arriving Israelis. The only other thing I, I want to note before we, we go on to, with you, Captain, is that most of the Palestinians who are now claiming to have you know, been there and they say the Israelis kicked them out, they started to emigrate into that region around the same time that there was an increase in Jewish emigration at the end of the 19th century. And the reason they started to emigrate there was because the Jews were building businesses and they were developing cities and they were developing farms and they wanted to work and they wanted to take advantage of it. They wanted, you know, they wanted to be a part of it. But they're not descended from any kind of ancient people. They all started to arrive essentially at the same time. I mean, if you look at Yasser Arafat, for example, he was Egyptian. I mean, there were a couple of very aristocratic Arab families that are still there that had been there all along and there were jewish families as well but it's a little deceptive to say that they had some kind of an indigenous right to the region because they really started emigrating en masse around the same time as the jews started emigrating en masse which started in the late 19th century all right that must be like you say you're going to do it you you answer that in the jewish way as you would say so um, I'll give a different. <laughs> How else would I? <laughs> That's why we're here. Right. <laughs> Let's get a little Jewish perspective, right? <laughs> we know Jewish, man. Man. You know the Jews, right? We can, we yeah. can, be, we can be a little tricky, all right? <laughs> little, you said a little tricky? I wouldn't say a little tricky. I'm just I would, say, no, I would say a whole lot of tricky. That's, that's what I'm saying. A whole lot of trickiness? Yeah. I'm, I'm saying it as I know it. Yeah, so like, so like when I look at the history, um, you yeah. can go back to the uh, Jewish Colonial Trust that uh, Theodore Herzl uh, first started. When he first started that, you could you could say Theodore Herzl is the father of Zionism or Zionist, however you want to. Modern know. Zionism, not Zion. As I said, Zionism is part All of right. Judaism. No, One wait, thing we let it do. Finish. Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I turn into a different person when I get interrupted. Just yeah, like, no, I was, I was, I was let him go because I we, we have respectful <laughs> so far. Go, go, go ahead, Captain. No, 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 no. no. Okay, <laughs> hold on one second. I got to unmute on my other thing. Okay, so what I was saying was, um, you got <laughs> you threw me off a little bit. So, you got the Jewish Colonial Trust, that's the original name of the bank, Lou Lu May, Lou Am I, if I'm saying Lou Me, yep, I appreciate that. That's two, uh, Lou Me. Um, the original name was Jewish Colonial Trust. Why do people think it was colonial? Because colonial goes with colonized colonialism. Things that um, other nations do when they take a, another people's land and then imprint their way of life onto that land. Um, you can look up Theodore Herzl's letter where um, he spoke about colonizing. I believe the letter was to, let me see if I could find it in my notes. I believe the letter was to, oh my God, man, I can't find Oh, yeah, to um, Cecil Rhodes. Because Cecil Rhodes, he had just did the same thing. He had colonized Shona. In Africa, and they right. and named it Rhodesia, yeah. and uh, Herzl applauded that effort. And it says it doesn't involve Africa, but a piece of Asia Minor, not Englishmen, but Jews that colonized in Africa. Because you know, Jews try to be, Jewish people try to be innocent of these things, but they're colonizers just like every other white man is a colonizer. It says, so how then do I happen to turn to you in this way out of the matter for you? How indeed, because it is something colonial. You, Mister Rhodes, are visionary politician or practical visionary. I want you. 
put the stamp of your authority on the Zionist plan and to make the following declaration a few people to swear by you. This was always the Zionist plan to colonize Palestine. That was a plan. So when you go, that's what the bank was for. That's why it was originally called Jewish Colonial Trust. That was built specifically for the hope or land, excuse me, of establishing the land that ultimately became Israel, but it probably could have been anywhere. And they would have been fine with it being anywhere, but they wanted their own land. Then from there, you have the letter that uh, Belford wrote to Mr. Rothschild. And it says, I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of his majesty's government, the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations. Which side note, it's really weird when you got uh, Belford and them having this so-called empathy, because even when I read your book and when I looked up online, European nations wasn't really rocking with y'all as far as allowing y'all to come into their country in mass. Like people like to make it seem like Hitler just didn't want y'all there, but the British didn't want y'all, America didn't want y'all, Poland, no nation, no European nation. And you say this in your book. As a matter of fact, in your book, you highlight that the earth played a part in the um in what Hitler did in, in the Holocaust. I did, um, yeah. mm -hmm. Right. You know what I mean? So you but you guys, what I want to show here is that the desire to go to Palestine preceded uh Hitler, preceded oh, yeah. Germany. Sure. It had for nothing sure. to do with the Holocaust. And that's what most people believe. And that's the sympathy that the so-called well the Jewish man plays on. He plays on that the Jewish people were slaughtered to the tune of six million. And because of that, you get so much sympathy. But what they don't realize is that Herzl was trying to colonize Palestine and put the plan in effect in the 1890s. Oh, yeah. No question. I don't disagree with that. When we have the Belford Dec So now remember, the subject is genocide. You colonize the people by genocide. This is the Belford Declaration. It shows that even during the first world... Well, okay, I just broke that down. So I want to go to my next... I'm going to try to be short. I know you went about eight minutes. So I'm going to try to be short. Um, the Belford Declaration. This is what the Belford Declaration was. It says it was endorsed by the principal allied powers and was included in the British mandate over Palestine, formally approved by the newly created League of Nations. By the way, the League of Nations are just as horrible because what they would do is when they defeated the German and Ottoman Turk in World War, their Asian and African possessions, which were not judged ready to govern themselves. So now after the war with the Ottoman Turks, the lands that was left, meaning the Africans and Asians that was left, they would judge not to be able to govern themselves, not by the Asians and Africans, but by the ruling powers that yeah. they chose to say that they could. And what I want to show a timeline is this is what all white people think. All white people think, man, we have to judge them. We have to govern them. We have to colonize them. So now the Belford Declaration stated that in May 19th, the British government, I'm sorry, in, in May 1939, the British government altered its policy and white paper recommending a limit of 75,000 further immigrants and an end to immigration by 1944. This is what the Belfort Declaration was supposed to be. Unless the resident Palestinian Arabs of the region consented to further immigration, Zionists condemned the new policy. Why? Because their whole goal was to colonize, even if that meant destroying the people that lived there. This point was made moot by the outbreak of World War II and the founding of the State of Israel. I'm gonna mm. keep going. Um, this, now, this what I have here, and I, I will share my screen if y'all need to see this. But a lot of people also believe that there was no Jewish people working with in the German or the Nazi regime. That's also not true. In the beginning of the Nazi rule in Germany, the Zionist movement was inclined to cooperate with the line that the Nazi government adopted at the time, encouraging immigration of mm -hmm. Germans. Jews to arrest Israel. So it wasn't even a direct opposing at that time because they are working with the Germans to move to arrest Israel. In the spring of 1933, the leaders of German Zionist Association decided to contact elements within the Nazi party who might support the Zionist cause. Kurt, right. Kurt Tuschler, a German Jewish lawyer and judge and member of the managing committee of Germans. So now we have Jewish people that are in positions within the what y'all would call the Nazi party, working with the Nazis. So you can't even say that they, the Nazis was against all of them, just, I guess, as a whole. So then you have the video I was telling y'all about um, where the, uh, in 1943, when the Jewish refugees entered Palestine, 
They was carrying a banner saying, Germans destroyed our families and our homes. Don't you destroy our families and homes. And you know what the Palestinians did? They welcomed them in there. Mm -hmm. And what happened after that is where the bloodshed came. Are you aware? No, I'm sorry, before I skip to the bloodshed, then you got Harry Truman who took a bribe. And I know, I, I think I heard you speak about this. Um, I mean, as a matter of fact, I watched the interview with you and Ralph and y'all laughed because y'all said he was right to take the bribe if he did take the bribe. Am I, yeah, so you don't even dispute that. He no, I don't know if he did or not, but if he did, it was money well spent, as I said. Right, that's what you said, right. That's yeah. what you said, right. Well, yeah, so, I didn't say, by the way, I want to clarify, I didn't say he was right to take the bribe. I said it was a it was a good play by the Jews if they did that. Effect. Right, I, I just want to clarify. <laughs> Uh, that it was a, out of that, Ralph, yeah, don't put me in there hold on now wait a minute all right go ahead <laughs> <laughs> so now even <clears throat> when you look at the um the letter that he wrote when you look at the red letter that he wrote it says the government has been, been informed that a jewish state has been proclaimed in palestine and recognition has been requested by the provisional government thereof the united states recognizes the provisional government uh a de facto authority um, the provisional was added. It's not written in there initially. So even in that, it lets you know Truman was bribed to do that because other presidents did not want y'all. As again, as you admitted, the other president, America, did not want y'all to come over there. Palestine was the only place that that can happen. Right after that, you had Nakba. Are you familiar with Nakba? Yes, of course. Right. So Nakba was the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians in the mandatory Palestinian during the 1948 Palestinian war through their violent displacement and dispossession of the land. This is why history can't start at 2005 with this conversation. History has to start with uh, the Zionist movement for, uh, wanting to colonize Palestine for their gain and Palestine never giving up and always fighting back. Right. No matter what they may have to do. And the advantage that Israel has or the Israelis has is that y'all have America backing y'all today. You have Great Britain or Europe backing y'all, not your Europe, but Great Britain backing y'all today. And Hamas and them don't have that. That's why, no, like, that's Iran. why, that's <laughs> why you, but, but Iran is not America. America is the number one. Yeah, but Iran is an oil rich and powerful. They've got they don't have weapons, they don't have drones, they don't have all of that to fight against y'all. Yeah. So, no, they don't. They why just, do, they, why they, do you think they have the to proxies, the Houthi just to use drones to hit American why, boats? Why do you think they have to put their weapons, like you said, in hospitals? Because they don't have a military force like y'all have, and the back military force. America. And and Hezbollah has an even bigger one on the northern border. Yeah. That's cap. So it says, during the foundational events of Nakba in 1948, dozens of massacres targeting Arabs were conducted over five Arab majority towns and 750,000 Palestinians or Ar Arabian people were killed at the hands of Zionist militia. So when we talk- I've never heard that figure before. Yeah. Yeah. That's the number. Um, you know, can, I, can, I, can I have a shot here? Or... Yeah, yeah, no, no, you're good, you're good. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. There's a lot to address. I mean, first of all, you're absolutely right. I mean, it didn't start in 2005, and it didn't start with the Nazi movement. As I said earlier, the real immigration started mid to late 19th century, but every generation has seen Jewish immigration to their holy land. I would argue that it started with Abraham. When Abraham, when God told Abraham to go up to that land that I will show you, Blame that no. miserable little piece of beachfront. I don't know why he chose Israel, but that's what God commanded Abraham to do. And Abraham did that. So, you know, it goes way back. It's every generation that that we're, we're commanded to do this. Now, as far as uh, the uh, that Herzl and the, the colonial and all that, I think you're correct in that the modern Zionists were inspired by the European colonial movements. And they did model themselves after it. The only difference here and it's kind of an obvious one, frankly, is that Israel could, wasn't a colony because the, a colony requires a, a motherland that then sends out military people and, and others to conquer another country. There is no Jewish state by which they were sent out. They were kicked out of Europe. Nobody wanted, you know, they wanted them to leave Europe. The Israelis or the Jews 
organically settled that land. They weren't colonizers, they were settlers. And as far as col colonialism goes, you know, it's I, I, I'm not in favor of it, especially in Africa. But, you know, it's also kind of a mixed bag in that, look, the American um, country was in a sense colonized by Europeans, um, you know, and, and, and they fought wars against Native Americans. Those are just facts of history. It's a, if you want to really go back, it was the Arabs who colonized North Africa and the Middle East and conquered. These were predominantly Christian countries and they were subdued by the forces of Abu Bakr and, and Ali and others who came out of Asia, out of Arabia and they conquered these countries. So, I mean, we could go, you know, we could talk about, uh, you know, who is indigenous and who conquered. I would argue that the Jewish claim for that little country in terms of being indigenous is a better claim than the Arab claim. I'm not disputing the Arab claim. I just would argue that the Jewish claim is the better claim and that Arabs actually are predominant in over 22 countries around the world. These are oil rich, vast, resource rich countries. And that Israel has none of that. Israel is not oil, it has no oil. They, they've got no population, it's tiny. And as far as Truman goes, recognizing Israel, oh, the Nazis. Yeah, sure, the Zionists cooperated with the Nazis in order to get Jews to come to Palestine. Why not? It's too bad they couldn't have gotten more. Mm. As, far as, mm. as far as Truman goes, Truman, whether or not he was bribed, it's not the, all that relevant. The point is that everyone in the establishment told him not to recognize Israel because it wasn't in America's interest the Israelis like to say, oh, it's America's interest. We're the best allies. We're That's a lot of bull. Israel's not right about that. It's not in America's interest to recognize and to deal with Israel because Israel doesn't have much in comparison to the Arab world, which is vast and oil rich. And that's exactly what Truman was told at the time by Secretary of State Marshall, by Secretary of Defense Forrestal, by the Council on Foreign Relations, by the entire rotten white supremacist international establishment that did not support Israel, that in fact hated Israel. And that Truman, in spite of all of that pressure, he turned around and he recognized Israel. Now, whether he did it because he was bribed or not, I don't care. The fact is that he did it, and I view it as having a divine element to it. And in fact, right after he did it, Chaim Weitzman, the first president of Israel, arrived at the White House giving him a gift of a Torah. And he said to him, God put you in your mother's womb so you would grow up to do what you've done. It's changed history of the world. And he compared Truman to Cyrus. Now Cyrus, of course, was the Persian emperor who defeated the Babylonians. And he wrote a decree commanding the Jews to go back to their homeland and to rebuild their temple. That's in the book of Ezra, which is part of the Christian um you know decalogue and so that to me is really the story here there is a you know israel is a it, you know it's a nationalist and religious movement at the same time and it has both a nationalist and religious element to it which should inspire all nationalist movements and religious movements around the world the fact that israel has gone through what they've gone through to retain and maintain their sovereignty and to develop this incredibly dynamic society that includes, by the way, Arabs and, and Muslims, should be an inspiration to all countries, especially Arab countries who want to get rid of their corrupt leadership and develop their also develop successful societies. Oh, can I get in there now? Yeah, go ahead, Kevin. Oh, yeah, please. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's I want everybody to note that usually when anybody works with Germans, they call them anti-Semitic and they charge them with war crimes. But if you're a Zionist, you can work with the Germans. Oh, before the Holocaust, don't forget. And but if you're a Zionist, you can work with them, and it's not considered a war crime before or after the Holocaust. If you, they will lock you up at 90 years old. They lock up 90 year old Germans for war crimes. But you, if you're a Zionist and work with the Germans, you're not considered anti-Semitic, which I would like to discuss, and mm -hmm. it's not considered a war crime at all. That's the hypocrisy of them. Also, when you try to slide away and say that, um. um the colonization is something that y'all learned from America. Y'all also assisted in colonizing America too. 
by Jewish people played a role in the slave trade. Insurance companies were created by Jewish people through the slave trade. Bank, <laughs> banks were established. Right. So don't act like Jewish people are unfamiliar with colonization. Y'all are just as culpable as the other Europeans that colonized. So y'all know this work. When you say that this is religious, but you acknowledge um, the history of what y'all went to do to establish by colonizing, that is not religious. Nowhere in the Bible did God say, go colonize these people. Even, and we want to talk about Abraham, that's going to be a whole nother ball of wax. I don't know if you're ready, but when God, when the children of Israel went to take the land, he didn't tell them to colonize them. He actually said, have no dealings with them. Don't resurrect their God. Don't marry their daughters. Don't do any of that. He never mm -hmm. said to colonize. He never said to enslave them. As a matter of fact, Deuteronomy 23 and 7 says, thou shalt not abhor an Edomite, for he is thy brother, nor the Egyptian, for thou was a stranger in his land. So if y'all coming in as the stranger, you actually broke Torah by then violating and causing mass genocide against the Palestinians because they welcomed you in. If we want to talk about Abraham, now that gets into the Bible or into the Torah, and then the conversation would have to be, do you have Torah rights to even be in that land, which I would say no. My position is that you have no connection to Abraham at all. No, I'm sorry, let me rephrase. You do have connection to Abraham, but you're just not the chosen seed of Israel, according to Torah at all. I got a quick question. Are you, or do you consider yourself an Ashkenazi Jew? Or what type of Jew would you classify yourself as? Probably Ashkenazi. I mean, my, my family came from, uh, you know, the Pol Poland, Belarus, that region. Okay. But yeah, they're Ashkenazi. They're not Sephardic you, and they're not right. Mizrahi. You know, you know, Ashkenazi is from Jaffet. They're not even from Shem. I reject that. That's that's completely that's in the Torah. The, well, first of all, the term Ashkenaz in the Torah is the word for Germany, just like the word Sephard is the word for Spain. So you have Sephardic Jews who are from Spain. When I read the Bible, it's not, it's, these are just national terms. It's not gotcha. doesn't describe the people. Gotcha. So Genesis three, ten and three says, um, I'm sorry, the ten and two. It says the sons of Japheth, Goma, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Teraz. Verse mm -hmm. three. And the sons of Goma, Ashkenaz. Right. So you're and not, the Ashkenaz settled in Germany and they became Germans. But you're not Shemitic then. You're no, no, German. no. The Jews are not German. Are we German? We are. I, I, would, I would say you're German. No, I would say I'm a Jew. Um, look, the you Ashkenaz. It, it's say. sort of like, you know. This country, in this country, we're called Americans, but we have different ethnic backgrounds. I mean, we're, we're black, we're white, we're you know, we're Hispanic, we're Asian, but we all call ourselves Americans. Germans, if you're in Germany, you're called yeah. German, but there are different ethnic backgrounds, and the Jewish people are a different ethnic background than the the Germans. Well, another question for you: So, yeah. anybody would anybody from Shem be able to use the term Semitic? I would su I suppose I mean these these terms are sort of modern terms that came from this German social theorist. No, no, but biblically speaking. Yeah, I would say so. And I think the Arab is Semitic. So why are they considered anti-Semitic? Why would I we? Be I didn't say they are anti-Semitic. <laughs> I mean, I think anti-Semitism uh -huh. is is based. It started out. Put it this way: it started out in the late nineteenth century uh -huh. by this theoretician Wilhelm Marr. Right, who uh, okay. was into race theory, and he developed all this business about the Semitic race, the Hamitic race, who are black, the Japheth, who are white, mm -hmm. and and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I don't know what he called Chinese people, but he developed this whole ridiculous, crazy race business. But y'all run with it, though. It, it can't be that crazy. Y'all ran yeah. with it. The what? Y'all ran with it. Y'all use it to this day. Well, the, well, wait a minute. Let me finish my point here. Okay. okay. It started out as a racial term uh, to describe Jews, and if you were against Jews, you were against them as a race. You were anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. But in this day and age, and I think particularly since World War II and the Nazi Holocaust, it generally has an overall meaning of simply being anti-Jewish. That if you're anti-Jewish, it's not because you're racially anti-Jewish. Mm -hmm. The Nazis were anti-Semitic in terms of they viewed the Jews as a race, but they also 
were anti-Jewish in a political sense. They believed that Jews were involved with the conspiracy to rule the world and a lot of the stuff in the Protocols of Zion and a lot of the stuff was found in Karl Marx's work mm -hmm. that the Jews secretly run the, the governments, they run banks, all that kind of crap. Hey, so, anybody, would anybody be in Germany, excuse me, anybody in Germany actually Ashkenazi? The Jews would be mostly, some of them are Sephardic, but most of the Jews of Germany and Eastern no, Europe I mean, are I mean, Ashkenazi. I mean, by, I mean from, by Torah. No, they're not, they're not literally Ashkenazi. They live in Ashkenaz, which is Germany. Oh, what I'm asking you, is there anybody, let me say it differently, is there anybody in Germany that's ethnically Ashkenaz? Yes, the Germans. So you said all the Germans are ethnically Ashkenaz. I mean, from a biblical standpoint, yes, just like all of the Spanish are Sephardic, because yeah, Sephard okay. is the biblical name for Spain. So now, we, so that we can go on record Galactic that sent five dollars with Arabian Palestinians, we rounded myself, up blacks, put them we on a can't be anti-Semitic because we Israel. are Semitic. I think right? it would solve a lot of the world's problems. I suppose. But, but you, if you want to look at the term Semitism in a racial context, yeah, right. you couldn't be anti-Semitic because right. you're right. Arabs are Semitic people. So yes, racially speaking, you're right. You'd be against yourself. I get that. However, as I said, the, the say, term, like so, a lot of terms, they evolve over time. And now the word anti-Semitism has simply come to mean anti-Jew. Right. So that's what I was going to say. So what you guys did was actually be more anti-Semitic than Palestinians or those of my kind that say we're Israel. Meaning this, you just said ethnically, yes, Palestinians are Shemitic. I'm saying Shemitic because of Shem, but of course, right. Semitic is fine. Right. And as well as us. But they are called anti-Semitic just because they're not fighting y'all because y'all are Jewish. That's not why they're fighting y'all. They're fighting y'all because you have invaded their land, pillaged and killed their people, forced them to not have their way of life that they've had, and so they are just fighting back. And the propaganda, not evolution, because you said the word has evolved, the propaganda is if you say anything against that, you're anti-Semitic. But I say you guys have been anti-Semitic since you invaded Palestine because you've been doing nothing but slaughter Shemitic people. You understand that? First of all, they they are fighting Israel because they're anti-Jewish. You can say anti-Semitic. We could get into if a Chinese game of semantics. Uh, just a quick question, I'll give it right back to you. If yeah. Chinese people did the same thing that y'all did, you went into their land, divided Palestine in half, and called it China, would they be anti-Chinese? Well, look, we what we already went over my opinion on this. We disagree. <laughs> Captain, we disagree on this. I don't. I would argue that the Jews are indigenous to that tiny country. No, no, no. no. My this is my hypothetical question because you said yeah. you said that they're doing it because they're Jewish. So my hypothetical question: yes. is, If Chinese people did exactly what you guys did, went and divided Palestine in half, displaced the people, killed them, made them move, would they be considered anti-Chinese for fighting back? Well, if that's what the Israel Jews did, but I would argue that that's not what happened. That's what y'all did. Y'all displaced them. Y'all divided the no, land. No, that's I, yeah. I reject you that. You said they wanted their land divided? I reject that. I reject that, Captain. And no, I'll tell I'm you. I'm just asking. Are you saying they wanted their land divided? They Yeah, but the point is that it's a civil oh, war between two it? people. I, that, I ain't oh, saying it's a civil war. I'm agreeing it's a civil war. What I'm saying is that Palestine want their land divided. And taken from no, them. they wanted the whole thing because they, they wanted right, it all they to the Arabs. Right. At so least the radicals right. did. Right. So if y'all didn't do that, we were willing to share it. Y'all was and, not willing to share it because, according to the Belford Act, y'all didn't like the Belford Act. The Belford Act said seventy-five thousand immigrants can come in. Y'all could build, but you had to leave the Palestinians' religious and way of life alone. And y'all didn't like that. So you can't say that y'all mm -hmm. wanted to live in peace. We can get into the weeds here, but I would argue that the Palestinian Arabs would have been left alone if they had not started to commit atrocities against the Jews. And the Jews fought back, and they did so, and they have nothing to apologize for. 1920, you had bloody Passover. Uh, this radical by the name of Hajamin al Husseini comes down and he, he basically agitates a riot against the Jews. This was the first time it happened where 50 Jews were slaughtered at the Western Wall in Jerusalem praying.
Mm-hmm. They were not fighting back at the time. They didn't have any kind of militias at Who that time. Fighting back? You talk about the Jewish people wasn't fighting no. back? At that point, they hadn't. They were basically farmers, and they were not set up to, to engage. They reacted to the bloody Passover attack by establishing militias and fighting. Right, them. that was. But now, but in the 1930s, those same Palestinians invited y'all in. The only and when you think about it, y'all should have showed them more love than anybody on the planet because no other nation, your white brothers, would not let y'all come. But here it comes, your Shemitic brothers, the ones that you call you know, your Shemitic brothers. I, I think that you're you're viewing this with somewhat of a rosy glasses, if you if you don't mind my saying. Oh, hell no. Some of them invited them in and others slaughtered them, like Hajimin El Husseini who would launch these agitations and he would start to kill the uh, Jewish settlers wherever he could find them. They were, and they fought back and you had a civil war and the Jews won. Just so I could go on the record, I'm not pro-Palestine. I started this argument, but excuse me, this conversation by saying that I can speak from both sides. I can look at what the Israelis have done, what the Palestinians have done, and then my judgment off of them. So because y'all have been forcing colonization since the 1890s, Y'all have made that decision to colonize Palestine. Palestine. No, colonize Palestine. I, I don't think, I don't view it as a colony. You just agreed that Scherzer was colonizing. No, he, he was admiring the colonial European He wasn't just a that was his blueprint. You know, a- as I, no, 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 no. As I said, in order to colonize, you have to have a country that you operate from or, that or has another country. Or, the Jews didn't have that. Have, or you can have backing. Which is why I read the letter that uh, Rothschild received that they had backing to colonize from the British. Right. Okay. So they had, uh, y'all, you didn't like that one. Yeah, yeah. No, so all right, look, I uh, grant you that, you know, the Jews so, did whatever they had to do to further Zionism, which I was not. And I'll state my own, I'll state my own bias here. I am a Zionist or I'm pro Zionist. I believe in the oh, Zionist so I, enterprise. So right. But what, what I'm saying is, I don't want you this because you talk like a Jewish person, you could sound sympathetic and correct, but it's not correct because you made it seem like the only pl- only way you can colonize is if you have a nation or land of your own, which right. by default is true. The only other way you can colonize is if you get backing from another country that does have land and the military and stuff of okay. the own. All right, you've, brought, you've added that wrinkle to it, and I'll agree to that. Wrinkle, that's history. That's history. Oh. Fine, I'll agree to that. So, well, yeah, what, that says, what that said is the, the Arabs had their own backers too. Wait, 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 wait. Hajimin El Sandy traveled around all of the Arab countries raising money oh, well, you to agitate against the Jews. So, I mean, there were backers on all sides. But it you was would have to say, war, and the Israelis fought it and won. But you would have to say that you guys were on the offense of colonialism and the Palestinians was on defense. No, they, I, 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 so I, I, take it off, take it off minute, Captain. We could go back and, and, and play this tape again. What I said was that the people, the settlers, which you call colonialists, both Arab and Jew, essentially started arriving in mass around the same time, late 19th century. The Arabs started settling there because they wanted to take advantage of all the modern technologies and, and money and business that the Jews brought with them. So it wasn't, it's not quite the way the, the Arab side portrays it, that somehow the Jews showed up and that they just simply took over the country. Both populations started to settle in there around the same time. Both populations made the same claims and I respect the Arab claim. I simply argue that the Jewish claim is a, the better claim. It's a superior claim. It's a reasonable claim to have that tiny country, given the fact that Arabs stretch all the way from the African coast right up to the South Pacific, the Arab and Muslim countries. The Jewish claim is a very proper and modest claim of that tiny speck of land that the Bible does tell us to take possession of. Mm. Book of Deuteronomy, Mm. it lays out the exact borders of what God commanded us to take. It's from the Jordan River to the sea, what the Palestinians call from the river to the sea. And in the north, you had Dan, which was a settlement that is now at the very northern tip of Israel. And in the south, you had Beersheba, which is still there. It's an ancient city. The only land that technically Israel is actually occupying that is not biblically commanded is a stretch of desert that goes south from Beersheba to the Gulf of Elat. 
that's called the Negev, which is the Hebrew word for desert. Other than that, Israel exists exactly in the borders that God, the Lord God, King of the universe, commanded that they take possession of. And those are very modest and tiny borders. If I could just correct one thing. Um, sure. The Arabs in them, they, they came in in the 1800s, 370,000 uh, at that time uh, to 10,000 Jews. So um, they um, they were in that land predominantly. Well, both people were in that land. I mean, and, and about, so like, but when we talk about majority, 370,000 to 10,000, it's like a speck. Okay, I'll agree with that. They, were, they had a majority. But the point I'm making is that most Arabs today who claim to be indigenous Palestinians arrived around the same time the Jews arrived. Okay, so now when we get to this biblical part, right, when you say um, that biblically y'all have a right to that land, your your position is that biblically y'all are the children of Israel? Of Israel, that's right. Yes, how, that is my position. How do you substantiate that? Okay, well, I substantiate it by simply looking at, at history. Joshua crossed the battle, across the Jordan River, fought the Battle of Jericho. The 12 tribes entered the land. They took possession of the different regions that they were told to take possession of in Deuteronomy. Eventually, they united under first King Saul and then King David to form a united kingdom. It reached its pinnacle of power under Solomon, who became corrupt because he had a thousand wives. <laughs> and then afterwards, it divided into two states, Israel and Judah. Israel was conquered by the Assyrians and taken into captivity, not never to be heard from again. Judah, and some of them settled in Judah, Judah survived another hundred years or so, and eventually was taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar and went into exile on the banks of the Babylon. We know this from the, the prophets. We know it from the book of Ezra. But eventually, the Babylonians were conquered by Cyrus, who commanded them to return to their country. They did. That's history under Ezra. They no, rebuilt that, the temple. But that's not what I'm at. Okay. Well, you have to trace the history of our people. No, no. What I'm saying is, so I believe that we are the children of Israel. You believe that you are the children of Israel. And I'm making my case. I'm making okay. how it happened. Okay. 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 I got you. Good. I'm sorry. Good. All okay. right. So then anyway, uh, Ezra reestablished the Judean state under the Persian uh, sponsorship. Eventually it became independent. That's what the Hanukkah story is all about. They kicked out the Greeks. They became sovereign under the Hasmonean dynasty. Right. Eventually Rome came in under Pompey and um, created a client state under Herod, who was evil. And uh, then they had a rebellion. They fought the Jewish wars, according to Josephus, which they lost in mm -hmm. 70 AD. And Israel, Jews, Jerusalem, the temple was destroyed. They had an uprising about 100 years later, the Bar Kokhba rebellion, which they also lost. But they continued. Uh, they continued with the writing of the Talmud. And that documents how they remained in their communities, along with the Samaritans, who many people say are actually descended from the Lost Ten Tribes. And that continued right up through the Roman and Byzantine times, right through the Christian times, until finally under the Byzantine Emperor Herod Herodotus, they rebelled and became sovereign again briefly. And that sovereignty was eventually defeated by Herodotus, who 15 years later was defeated by the Muslim invaders. So that brought us to the modern times. Now, ever since then, the Jews of the Holy Land continued there. They, they basically, the, the numbers went down, but there was always an attempt to, re, to, to return. Um, there's a historic movement that has occurred in every century to return to that country until eventually they did. And they finally achieved sovereignty in 1948. That's the history. Uh, we are the same people. Why would we? Why would you think? I mean, uh, you know, can you trace your ancestry back to that? Yeah. I mean, if we, if we have to talk I, about I this in, in, in racial terms, yeah. I don't think so. Okay. So what I would, what I could do, is exactly what you just did. Okay. Is I can give that same history, and then where I would branch off from you, is in 70 A.D. when Jerusalem fell. Jews fled into Africa, specifically the west coast of Africa. We kept yeah. our we kept our records in the west coast of Africa. That's why you can see ancient maps where we say land of Judah or yeah. we say 
Negro land. You would see that. And so when it came time for us to come over here in the transatlantic slave trade, them Africans knew exactly who they were selling. They was not selling fellow Africans. They were selling Israelites that they was getting off of our land. A famous um, uh, slave hero, Harriet Tubman, she knew she was an Israelite. Her family knew they was Israelites. When they go back to tribes in Africa known as the Ashanti tribe, X, Y, Z, like that. So for us, now, now what I was looking for is for you to pair the Bible up with what you said. So like when I look at Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, when it talks about the curses that we would endure, one of those curses in Deuteronomy 28 and 68 says we would be brought into Egypt again, which is bondage with ships. That's the transatlantic slave trade. And it says, there you shall be sold for bond men and bond women. We were the ones sold for bond men and bond women. And when it says no man shall buy you, meaning nobody would redeem you except the Savior or Messiah, which would come to redeem us. So then that would be my position. Also, I could go even further and say when Roman ruled, Roman didn't fall in a day. So when Rome eventually fell, black people actually ruled Europe. I'm saying black because that's the general term, but right. Israelites ruled Europe for a time. That's what they call I agree with that. That's right. That's historic. In fact, the Septimus dynasty in, in, in Rome, they were black. Septimus right. Severus was black. I yeah. mean, the Romans didn't have any issue with race. I mean, right. Romans, well, race, Romans race, were, uh, were black and white. I mean, it's right. not, you know. Yeah, race didn't really become a thing until slavery became. I agree. Became business. So when we ruled and they called that the Dark Ages, that's why even Benjamin Franklin, anybody can look this up. He said, we didn't want America to be black like Europe. That's a quote from Benjamin Franklin. Well, uh, you know, the, the original wait, Americans wait, viewed, wait. viewed Scottish people as black. I mean, it's sort of. Yeah, they were. Thank you. Because yeah, they, no, I know that. Well, yeah. they call them swarthy. So when you exactly. say history, now you and I have both traced history. So the only other place we can go to determine who's Israel and who's not is back into that Bible. For example, when Moses met the Most High at the burning bush, he was told to put his hand in the bosom. When he took it out, it was white as snow, like a white man's hand would be. When he put it back in and pulled it back out, it went back like his other hand. You see where I'm going with it? I, I do. Look, I don't disagree with a word that you're saying. You right. know, that first of all, the ancient Israelites were probably a lot darker than than eventually the Jews became through intermarriage. I don't disagree with that. Right. And I also don't disagree that a lot of the Jews after the destruction of the temple did flee to Africa. In fact, I uh, welcome to the tribe. We're Jews. Man, no, I don't disagree with you at all. You know, and in fact, there's a, there's a group of there's a kind of several black tribes. What just happened? Subway. No, we're all we're we're both of the welcome home to the tribe. I mean, look, I mean, there's there's there are black tribes in Zimbabwe who practice Judaism, and they always have. They probably arrived there after the temple was destroyed. You know, there's no. I don't disagree. Look, there are there are now black. Uh, tribes coming in from Ethiopia and Somalia who are settling in Israel. Hey, but Ralph, <laughs> Ralph, I'm gonna tell you something, Ralph. I see why the Jewish man is the top white man on the on the because <laughs> his slick talk is above reproach. He heard all that I said, and he said, "Welcome home, we're Jews." Like the we're both Jews, we're both of the same. Yeah, no, and by the way, I don't consider myself to be white either. Well, white, that's why I was saying earlier when I was saying black, small, I was like that. That's, contract. Like, right. I was even when I said uh, in Europe they were black I, and I, I said that's that's not what we would call them back then. That's kind of like words that we use today. But right. to get back to the point, we are not the same. Here's how you know, like, although you're saying that on this stage tonight, I don't think nobody in the audience believes you, because when we look at the history of interaction between you mentioned ethiopians if you go back to the children of demona that tried to go back into um israel they were all returned home they were never allowed well, no, they were allowed to stay but they israel did oh. a lot more of them to come well, no no they're no. still there they're still there in demona ah, that's a lot i'm trying i'm just trying to find an article so i could just speak intelligently about it okay, okay. That's, but that's not true I'm, hold on, let me see. I think I, there's still a lot of them are still there. Israel did put a stop to their immigration into Israel. That's true. There we go. It did not recognize their Jewishness. You're right. Right. So it says this. This is from AP News. After decades of struggle, dozens of African Hebrew Israelites faced deportation. 
This is in, still there. I mean, I'm sure something. This, uh, this is July 20, but they don't do that to y'all though. No, they don't. You're right. They don't recognize right. those Jews. You're right, right. Absolutely right. Right. So when you say welcome home, I would get killed going over there. Well, wait a minute, but they do recognize the Jews from Ethiopia as Jews, and they're coming oh, in. Let me, let me find that one. Let me find that one for you. Yeah. Just in case you think that. Oh, this is the one. Oh, well, let me read this real quick before I forget, because a question got okay. sent in. So it's from Galactic. He says, "Would Captain be okay if we rounded up?" All blacks put them on a boat, gave them guns, and let them have Israel. I think it would solve a lot of problems. Is what he says. What he said with his. <laughs> Captain like that. All right, go ahead. Sorry, I, I just I want to make sure I got that in. <laughs> no problem, bro. So now this is March of 2022. Remember, he just said they ain't rejecting the Ethiopians that say they Jews want to come home. High court rejects petition allow, allowing thousands of Ethiopians to immigrate to Israel. Injunction lifted on government plan to bring pe people with Israeli relatives who are eligible for citizenship, immigration minister. These immigrants waited for no reason. The High Court of Justice has rejected an appeal that prevented the government from bringing over Ethiopians eligible for Israeli citizenship. And thousands of Ethiopian refugees will arrive shortly. Immigration and absorption, excuse me, absorption, Minister Queen Panina Tamano Shado said Tuesday. In November, the government approved the plan to let some of them in there, but they rejected that. So when you say that we're the same, when you say, because if it's about the diaspora, that Jewish people always talk about, then yeah. you, everybody come in, which is why I said earlier, Jewish people are the most anti-Semitic people that exist today. You have no love for your fellow Semitic brethren at all. Now, if you can well, we, we also have a Jewish identity. And look, I mean, first of all, there are black uh, Ethiopian and Yemenite Jews arriving now in Israel. I'm not saying Israel's perfect in that way, but they are there. Look, my I have four cousins in Israel. My 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 cousin and his wife emigrated to Israel in 1960s mainly because he didn't want to go to Vietnam. And so he went to Israel and he fought in the Israeli army. They had four children. Of those four children, three of them are married well one of them is married to a Yemenite Jew who's black. The others are married to Mizrahi Jews who are Arab. I mean, that's the, the condition of Israel now. It's not. It's no longer just the Ashkenazis. It's a very integrated country. It's probably the most racially diverse country in the world, actually. Um, and that the Ethiopian Jews are arriving in Israel, and they're great Jews. It's not. A, there's no question about their Jewishness. Now you're talking about the Dimona situation. I don't think that they converted to Judaism. I mean, they were Christians. Yeah. No, no, no. They not only did they convert. I mean, I remember they put the video up. It's so sad. They converted, gave their children up to the well, IDF. Is that that's the military, right? Yes. They gave their children up to the IDF. They did everything that y'all asked for, and you still was trying to deport them. All right. Well, you know, look, I probably agree with you here. The rabbis that, that, that run Israel are they do tend to be a bit corrupt. I mean, they wouldn't recognize a would Trump conversion. It's ridiculous. I would I would say racist, but now back to yeah, probably right. I back to agree with you on that. Thank you. But back to um, why I say is you, your people and the Palestinians have no right to that land. As I just broke down Deuteronomy 28 and 68, as I just broke down Moses, Samson had braids in his hair. Seven locks is what they said. That's okay. a braid. Solomon said, I am black, but comely. That's what Solomon said. <laughs> yeah. Well, how do we go from being these nice brown skinned brothers with braids in their hair to now, you pale cats with yarmulkes on with side locks that you just twist to the side that ain't braid. You just say they locks. No, they yeah. use dippity. They use dippity do. Yeah, dippity do. Right. So you know what? You know what? It, you know what? It reminds me of. It reminds me of when you say American today, you think of the white man being American. You don't think about the Native Indians and the Hispanics that was here long before they came. So that's kind of what you guys did. You displaced. That's how you know you're good at colonizing, even if you ain't got a land, because even when you wasn't in the land of Israel, you displaced the whole race of people by claiming to be Israel when you're not. Well, well, first of all, look, I would agree with you in that. My question, I just want to include my question before you go. Yeah, what happened to the complexion? How do we go from this beautiful brown to this pale shit? <laughs> well, first of all. <laughs> I mean, I'll agree with you that the American Jews have done everything they can to pass as white. You know, I'll agree with that. 
just like Italians and have passed as white. I mean, and they're not necessarily. Um, Jews tend to be racially similar to the countries where they live. I mean, French Jews look French, German Jews look German, Chinese Jews look Chinese, and African Jews look black. It's just, I don't know if it's because of intermarriage or what, but you know, there is that tendency. And also because the original Israelites were darker, I mean, I think Jesus was probably black and that they certainly probably. were. Uh, he was a Jew. What else <laughs> he was he? a Jew. Yeah. And, but, so, and, and so he was darker than, than the Jews are today. But that doesn't necessarily mean, and I hope you don't think I'm being controversial by saying this, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that all of Africa is Jewish. You had black people in Africa that the Jews went to. Right. And then they intermarried with. Right. Um, so, you know, you could have, there certainly is a strain, ethnically speaking, racially right. speaking, right. of Jews who are black in Africa. And mm. not, a lot of them are moving to Israel. It doesn't mean that all blacks are Jews, and it doesn't mean that all Jews are black. Okay, so <laughs> the, the caucasity of Jewish people is insane to me. I asked him to show me how we go from this beautiful brown to this pale shit. He started talking about Italians and Africans. We don't believe everybody in Africa. I just said it's intermarriage. I mean, there's just like so intermarriage, and now everyone today that's considered a Jew is pale. So well, first pale, of all, we're not we're not pale. Do I look as pale as somebody yes. from Ireland? Yes, I'm not. Yes. I only it's because I have a light on. Yeah. Well, you're gonna try to turn the light off. And think you're gonna... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that pale. <laughs> man, you look like a ghost, man. <laughs> I'm as white as a sheet, right? Well, yes. look at it. I mean, it's I still so... ethnically, no, 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 no. racially, I mean, I still have certain. <laughs> But this aspects is, that are not not but, the same as somebody from Norway. But this is what's important because the Bible prophesied that there would always be war in the Middle East because that land does not belong to any of y'all. It doesn't belong to you. It don't belong to the Palestinians. I can recognize Holocaust when I see it, though. But just like in history, I can recognize what Hitler did to you guys was a Holocaust. What the America did to blacks and Native Indians was a Holocaust. And what y'all have done to the Palestinians since y'all invaded that land is a Holocaust. There is no denying it, but y'all create this anti-Semitism scary. It, like, it, it almost reminds me of like the LBGT. Like you can't say nothing about that community and then they'll come down on you. And you can't say nothing about, you can't even have a difference of opinion with Jewish people. Like I give you a lot of credit um, to have this conversation with me and then not be offended at what I'm saying because I'm not, I don't believe that I'm having an anti-Semitic conversation at all. But, Neither are. Right, but most people that I have this conversation with will call it anti-Semitic because I differ with the Jewish being able to colonize a people and I just be okay with it when I should not be okay with it. But what I do want to establish is that so far he has not proven that they are the people of God according to to the Torah or to not. And even when he brought up Jesus, Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. When you go to Acts 13 and one, it, that word niger means black. That's where the word nigger comes from. The word niger means black. And that's what they describe right. the disciples as. So up until 70 AD, they were still black in complexion. I, I don't, I don't deny I don't that. Know how I yeah, but, I, but you deny that they black today though. No, I just said that there are plenty of black people in Africa who can, Y'all well, gonna let a black man come and rule Israel? Y'all gonna let a black Jew? If, if he's a Jew, yes, of course. I, I'm a Jew. Heck, there's I... already been a black prime minister of Israel, I think. I'm a Jew. Can I come and rule Israel? If you can show that you're a Jew, and if you listen, man, put the word in for me. I'll come. To, I'll, listen, I was in Israel. And... <laughs> oh, I'll gladly yeah. come back and Look, rule. Ed, I oh. also want to talk about this whole business of anti-Semitism because okay, no problem. I, I agree with you in that the Jews were very touchy about this. And we do abuse the term. Anybody that doesn't agree, not only with Jews, but because the left has become so powerful within the Jewish community, anybody that doesn't agree with a left-wing agenda is called an anti-Semite. If you're right. against abortion, you're you're you know you're anti-Semitic. If you're against gay marriage, you're anti-Semitic. It's ridiculous right. and it's wrong and it's an abuse of the term. I would also add to the fact that black people in this country have done something similar, right? Mm -hmm. Jesse Jackson. Al Sharpton, they go to a corporation and they say, hey, put us on the board of directors. Right. Hey, this person, this and that. 
or else we're going to call you racist. Anybody that disagrees is called racist. This is a terrible abuse for Jews, for blacks, for gays, for anybody to use their agency to try to accuse others as a way to assert privilege. And it's wrong. And I, I totally reject it. I think the ADL is terribly wrong. If you read my book, you see I did a whole chapter on them. I didn't get to that part yet. I, okay. I, got, up to, um, I got up to Marx. Okay. Hitler. I got up to Marx and Hitler. I wanted to play this Hitler clip, but I don't know if I'm going to get no, banned. Please. Play a hit. Nothing like a little Hitler. Hitler. Like, it explains, well, it backs up. Hitler says what you said in your book. Hitler says, um, hold on, I play this for I did this for Ralph. Ralph likes when I play Hitler. So I sure. Let's hear it. We turn off kick. So yeah, go ahead. You should be able to <laughs> We did that for a reason because I I knew we had to catch it. Go ahead. Let me see. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Hold on. Let me see if I can find it quick. Hold on. I'm just looking for it. Oh, is it in my oh yeah, I got it right here. Let me share my screen. Okay. This is uh they translated his German into English. So let me share my screen here. Let me go here. Let me share. Present. Um, where are you at? No, not that. Uh, high court rejects. Oh, wait, window. Here we go. All right, there we go. Share audio. Just let me know if y'all can hear this, okay? This is uh, Hitler. Okay. Yeah, can you hear that? Yes. Okay. Right. Okay. That if I can have been in connection with the Jewish question, I have this to say. It is a shameful spectacle to see how the whole democratic world is oozing sympathy for the poor, tormented Jewish people, but remains hard-hearted and obdurate when it comes to helping them, which is surely, in view of its attitude, an obvious duty. The arguments that are brought up as an excuse for not helping them actually speak for us Germans and Italians. Well, this is what they say. One, we, that is the democracies, are not in a position to take in the Jews. Yet in these empires, there are not 10 people to the square kilometer. While Germany, with her 135 inhabitants to the square kilometer, is supposed to have room for them. Two, they assure us we cannot take them unless Germany is prepared to allow them a certain amount of capital to bring with them as immigrants. For hundreds of years, Germany was good enough to receive these elements although they possess nothing except infectious political and physical diseases. What they possess today, they have by a very large extent gained at the cost of the less astute German nation by the most reprehensible manipulations. I, I think that speaks volumes. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, it, it, I get into this also in my chapter or not. That's for you, Ralph. That's for you, Ralph. <laughs> I'm the moderator. I, I don't have any thoughts. No. Go, go ahead, Charles. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, Charlie. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, that you know the the uh, the Holocaust. I would argue, even though that the Nazis were responsible for it and Hitler was responsible, it represents a worldwide social experiment by an international order. And let me tell you what I mean. In 1938, just before the outbreak of World War II, the U.S. hosted what was called the Evian Conference in France, in the Spa community of Evian. And all and, and countries from around the world sent delegations to this conference because they were trying to figure out what to do with the quote Jewish problem, what to do with Jewish refugees who were trying to get out of Germany. At that point, things had gotten so bad that they just had to get out. And what they the, the solution they came up with was to do nothing. Now, there were plenty of countries in the world that would have welcomed the Jews. The Jews were not asking for handouts. They were mostly middle-class educated people, very skilled people in all the professions. You know, they were doctors, they were artists, they were lawyers, they were businessmen. You know, the Jews are very, we, we value education and we value success. That's one of the hallmarks of, of Judaism. And countries like Latin American countries, Canada, the Caribbean countries, they were willing to welcome Jews because they could have had the Jews help them become better. You know, the Jews could have helped them with their improve their economy. But this Evian conference shut the door to that and forbid that. And right after the Evian conference, a boatload of Jews who paid for the boat, the Liberty, went to Cuba. And when they got there, 
they had to turn back because the U.S. State Department and other organizations said you can't let the Jews come in. And so they had to send them back to Germany where they all ended up perishing in the Holocaust. So it was a social experiment. And I bring it up because for whatever reason, the international order decided that the Jews were to be destroyed at that time. Now I could get into why that happened, but the point I make here is that it's important to understand that the Holocaust is something that could happen to any group of people who might be targeted in that way, even to this day. I mean, I give, you know, I don't want to, you know, it could happen to Trump supporters. It could happen to people who oppose the, the COVID the virus, right? People who oppose the vaccine. There were comments made at the time that, oh, they're going to, these are evil people. They're going to put them in concentration camps. I only note it because it's a lesson, not because they were Jews, but because they were targeted. And there's no question that they were targeted in Europe and they were sealed into Europe. And when not, the Nazis occupied Europe, they occupied most of the continent. And they hunted down every Jewish man, woman, and child and um, put them into concentration camps with the idea of ultimately liquidating them. I, um, I just want to add my part on that, too. I think yeah. what this speaks to, even with your statement, is that the fact that y'all only hold um, Germans to the fire and not the other nations that rejected y'all um, is astounding meaning y'all don't hold Americans to the fire because by your logic, you're saying they was a Confederate against y'all. By your logic, you're saying the Europeans were a Confederate, did not want to accept y'all. And you know what makes it more bad for y'all? The fact that the Palestinians let y'all come in and y'all still killed them, it makes it real bad. Well, first of all, the, the British yeah. controlled hey, Palestine at the time and they had ships off the coast stopping Jews from going there. Wait, hold, hold on, I, I, I had drank some water. I wasn't really I'm stopping. Sorry. I'm sorry. No, 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 it's no big deal. It's been a good, good conversation. I so think so, too. It's really been good. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I just want to and so uh, what I, the reason why I wanted to point that out is that even with all those, all your white brothers rejecting you and then the one non-white brothers helping you, you chose to slaughter that person. You didn't choose to be against all of them that wouldn't accept you in. And that was Hitler's point because Hitler knew Hitler said. What Hitler said was the the other nations won't let y'all in and they have way more space where Germany is more crowded and they want us to to keep you in. They right. want us, if we send you out, they want Germany to send you off with a care package so that you can go back to the other land. Whereas maybe if the other nations would have helped Hitler and them get y'all maybe by acceptance or either by helping with financials. Maybe it would have never been a Holocaust. Exactly. And that's my whole point. Right. So essentially, you couldn't put the Holocaust only on Hitler. You would have to put it on every other country. And I think you that's. Do. You put it on the whole world because the whole world conspired by shutting the door to any Jew getting out. They turned Europe into so a. Now let's flip it. So now let's flip it on the subject that we're talking to today with, with Gaza. Okay. America helps um, Israel, British helps Israel. All. Uh, the uh, Palestinians got is Iran, which ain't got nowhere near the nuclear weaponry that America, British, and you guys have. Aren't y'all doing the exact same thing? No. With another people, what y'all are y'all are trying to do what Hitler did to y'all to the Palestinians. No. no. If if Gaza stops the tunnels, the missiles, mm -hmm. the gas balloons the hand gliders, right. the attacks on Israel, right. then Gaza will have peace. You Gaza, know, Israel doesn't that. want to fight Gaza. You know what you didn't say? If we leave their land alone and really divide and give them their own land, give them their, give them back their religious freedom, which is what the Belford Act said. Of course, like y'all ain't even respecting your own treaty, which is in the Bible. Like Psalms 55 and 20, it says his words smoothing and butter, but war was in his heart. If y'all just abided by the treaty, maybe y'all would show the Palestinians that, hey, man, we signed this treaty, man. We messed up. So what we're going to do, we're going to pull out, give you your land, and then maybe that and will the stop. Because they did with Gaza. And they would have done more had the yeah. Gazans will, will been willing to live peacefully alongside Israel. They no. were not. They attacked Israel. No, no. Be, well, you got to understand like when the native Indians, uh, when the white man came over here to America, y'all did that to the same native Indians, what y'all doing to the Palestinians. 
The other right. that, well, that, not exactly. I mean, look, the Palestinians have had every opportunity I mean, hold to up. share the country, that tiny country with Israel. And, and this is the part where Jewish people don't want to play the role. Not only did y'all play a role in slavery, but just like Hitler learned, like Hitler learned them camps from what white Americans did to the Native Indians with the um, reservations. That's historical facts. I think he actually learned it from the British, what they did in South Africa. With this is the same set of white people. So when they came over here with the 13 colonies, they're the same white people. They just I mean, came. I don't think that America set up concentration camps for the Native Americans. Didn't, no, I didn't say concentration camps. I said reservations. Well, fine. I mean, look, if they had set up a reservation they for both, Jews, it would have been but they both, But they both slaughtered the same. And so that colonization tactic is what y'all are doing to the Palestinians. The Palestinians just keep fighting. They, and the they, land is not they don't have they, they have massive. The land is not as massive as America is to where y'all can surround them and wipe them out. And because the TV is here and the Internet is here, you can't just drop a bomb and just get rid of them and then just write it off as history. Like Palestinians are so bad. You can't do that. Like, you know, they say the Native Indians were so savage. We had to civilize them just like y'all did. Well, I can't say y'all just like that American alliance that I, I brought out earlier. What they said was, let me get this real fast. What the uh, Allied powers said was the Asian and African possessions were not ready to govern themselves. That's what you're essentially saying to the Palestinians. Not at all. We gave That's them Gaza so they could have created a peaceful state yeah. there. No. And also, by the way, I think the Nazis were inspired by the Soviets and by their setting up of the Cheka and the Gula. Uh, I looked it up. So if you go to, um, this is on the History Channel, it'll tell you yeah. how the Nazis were inspired by Jim Crow. Oh yeah, no question. And 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 by the eugenic racism of yeah, I was inspired. Like, yeah, yeah, was... like um, you know, Madison Grant and and going back to Darwin and this whole racism like around space. Yeah, I was inspired. Yeah, I was inspired by them too. Everybody, look, the entire Western world is inspired by that, and it's wrong. But no, okay. So if it's wrong, then you should start a petition to your fellow Zionists to stop trying to colonize. That's the only but solution. Look at, I mean, all right. If, now that we're on the topic of solutions, first of all, Israel, you know, the, the Gaza had every opportunity, as I started with, to create a peaceful, sovereign Arab state there, and it would have gotten more. But instead, they chose to f start killing Jews and fighting Israel. And Israel fought back, and they have every right to. Now, at the end of the day, once this whole thing is over, and Israel has defeated Hamas, I don't think it's ever going to be over. Well, maybe not, but at least the active part will be, and there'll be a peaceful talk. There'll be a peaceful border there. I actually advocate that Israel offer citizenship to Palestinian Arabs as as Israeli citizens now, who are living in Judea, Samaria, and Gaza, under the Revan condition JJ sent one dollars on Rumble that Ralph, they undergo a one year training how the true basic God is of what it is to be an Israeli. And that they take a loyalty oath to the state of Israel as a Jewish state. I think if they're willing to do that, then they should become Israeli citizens. Now, the the Israeli Arabs, which make up about, I don't know, 10% of the country, they are very successful people. Do you know that an Israeli Arab sentenced a former Israeli prime minister to prison? She's a judge. Um, I have a friend in Israel who uh, who told me that a lot of the Israeli Arabs are into the business of pharmacy for some reason, just like in America, a lot of Greeks are involved with uh, pizza. You know, I mean, different ethnic groups get involved with different professions, and they're very successful Israelis. They have been they're loyal to the state of Israel. The only thing that they can't do in Israel, and this is a problem, is they're not allowed to join the IDF other than Druze and, and Bedouins who are allowed to be in the IDF. And the reason for that is that Israel's afraid that if they have a war, they might not have loyalty to the state. That's right. a problem. And they, they need to resolve it by letting them have some kind of national service. But other than that, Israeli Arabs are, are full citizens of the state of Israel, so, so, other than that the prime minister has to be a Jew. Well, first I want to call... Well, I, Yeah, you're going to vote for me to be the prime minister, right? <laughs> So you have to become a Jew. I'm already a Jew. See that? I think he now now remember just go back in time when I brought out the history. He said, Welcome home. Yeah, Be but being a, a practicing oh, Jew. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. I, listen, I keep Torah. 
I keep the my Passover is April 20. If I keep the Torah, I keep the Sabbath, I keep all the laws because I'm a Jew. He okay. just, earlier he said, Welcome home. That's why I told well, him. Then, then yes, yeah, if you're if you're a Jew and you're practicing God, Judaism, oh, then oh, yes, yeah, oh. you're a Jew. I'm about to tell you something else too. The thing about the Jewish man, I told you, Ralph, he's the creme de la creme of the white man, man. Does he know how to buddy you up and make you think you're something? Because him saying that I have to be a practicing Jew to be a Jew, a white Jew can be an atheist, he could be a homosexual, he still is a Jew. Well, he's, he's a Jew if his mother is a Jew. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on. I, I got, hold on. He yeah. said I have to be a practicing Jew. Even though I said, even no. though I said I'm a Jew, even though he said, welcome home to Jews, soon as it got real, he said, no, you got to be a practicing. Let you know. Israeli, you, but you there's a difference between how he looks at black people and his own people because he knows we're not the same. Because if a white Jew can be an atheist and still get the same rights, I should be able to go over there and get the same rights. Well, the, the, way, the, the, way the way Israel defines it, the way Israel defines it, you're right. I mean, you don't have to be a practicing, I don't have to be a practicing. Okay, you got so that double talk. Well, but the point is, if you can show that, for yeah, example, that yeah, your mother is yeah, a Jew, that's a snake. Speak with forked tongue. No, no, no. Uh, let's time, I, let's let's, let's define it. Come the on. state of Israel and the Talmud say that a Jew is someone whose mother is a Jew, and they can show that. Right. And if you can show that your mother is a Jew, right, and you can get by the rabbis in Israel, and I'm not saying they're all so great either, by the way. Right. <laughs> but now you know that's not. But you know that's going to be a little bit corrupt, as I mentioned. Right. Some of them are a little extreme. I mean, they wouldn't recognize Ivanka Trump as a Jew, which is horrible, because she right. is. But I tell you what, though, and this is why when we go back to the Torah, none of y'all, by what you just said, none of y'all are Jews, because the Torah say you're a Jew by your father. It ain't, no, 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 it says it mother. Not, no, show me that. You pull it pull it out in the Torah. I not, can't pull up a text right now. I just, that's, maybe... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, th I'm not. Look, I'm no rabbi. Yeah, but I, I, let me ask you a question: Is yeah. it the 12, is it the twelve daughters of Jacob or twelve sons of Jacob? Sons, but their son, their mother was a Jew. Their mother was Jew didn't exist until. First of all, now now I'm gonna educate you because we're in the Bible. Jew, okay. Jew means you're from Judah. That's only right. one son of Jacob. There's 11 other sons. You got Levi, Benjamin, Simeon, Naphtali, Ephraim, Gad, Issachar. So there's 11 other sons. Jacob is an Israelite. Their mothers, it's four women that mothered the 12 tribes. Leah, Rachel, Bina, and Zilpah. Zilpah and Bilhah. Those are the four women. Those, are not, those four women are not Jews. Jacob is an Israelite, and those sons that came out of Jacob became the patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel. So you're not an Israelite by your mother. You're an Israelite by your father. That's biblical. Well, first of all, Judah, his mother was a Jew. His mother was not a Jew. His mother was, was, uh, is the first was Jew. Leah. Judah is the first Jew. Okay, fine. Because you're I mean, named after your son. That's like, like. Yeah, it, but, but, but let me ask you this, Captain. Mm -hmm. Do if Judah is the first Jew, then the tribe of Judah, along with several other of the tribes who Judah absorbed, they're the only tribe that actually maintained a public, conscious, functioning identity as Jews. Because the other tribes have taken off into captivity. Nobody knows what happened to them. Okay, now, because so that, of the, the British Israelites say, well, they reemerged in Europe as white people. Right. I don't believe yeah, that's their thing. I mean, that's but you white though. But you white, you emerge as white. Remember, we just had the conversation yeah, over many centuries. Yes, oh, I got wait, lighter wait, because of intermarriage. Wait, 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 but yet the Jewish. Wait, wait, this is funny. How you gonna say these other Europeans just showed up as white and they Jews, but you white and showed up when you just said earlier they was brown like me? Yeah, but you know something, Captain. You're probably blacker than most of the Israelis in the time of Jesus. Oh, you said you put. What said it again? What I was I, what I'm saying is that if we want to talk race here, you are probably blacker in terms of skin color than the Jews of Jesus's day, because they intermarried with that's Africans. Cap. Okay, wait, wait, that's cat, but I don't want to leave this part. Okay, uh, when we talking about being an Israelite, you're an Israelite according to your uh, mother. You are. Oh, this is the part I wanted. You mentioned that the other tribes, the other tribes. 
majority were scattered, right? Which is right. right? So, yeah. but some of the tribes were still there. Like when you read the New Testament, you see Anna from the tribe of Asher, or uh, Paul was a Benjamite. So when you see in the New Testament collectively the term Jews, it could be one of three things. It could be the tribe of Judah, it could be the southern kingdom, which would be Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, or it could be Jews collectively as a whole, right? So when you go through history, we can get a book called Lost Tribes and Promised Lands where the Taino Indians and the Seminole Indians knew that they were from the tribe of Reuben and the tribe of Joseph. Well, now you're getting into Mormon theology here. No, that's, that's what they say. They say the Native Americans are in are, are descendants of the Ten Tribes. Yeah, you know, these are interesting speculations. And the yeah. British Israelites say that Britain and France are the Ten Tribes. Everyone claims to be the Ten Tribes, but they don't know this because they didn't continue Judaism. The only tribe that continued with Judaism why did they get scattered? was the Judeans. Why did, but y'all, but y'all are not those people. Your conversion was six. When did Islam convert? Seventh Your, century, I think. Thank you. And yours was sixth century. The reason why y'all converted, when you get a good book called Chosen People, now I'm going to give you some more of your history. When you get a good book called Chosen People of the Caucus, in that history, it'll tell you the war between the Byzantine Empire and the Arabs, the Khazars in the middle. The Byzantine Empire was trying to get the Khazars on their side, and the, Arab, the Muslims were trying to get the Khazars on their side. Right. The, the Khazars knew that Judaism or the Old Testament was the root to both of them and just started saying they were Jews. But they were never actually Jews. You know, you could, the Khazars, the, the royal family became Jewish. And so then you got the 13th tribe written by Arthur Kosler, another Jewish man. I have read that book, yeah. Yeah. And he says, you guys, it must be 13 tribes if you guys are Jews. No, no, no. I read that book very carefully. And, and he does not say that. That's the title of his book. But I, I actually, let me just interject here because I did read his book. The Khazars were a. Turkic nomadic people north of the Black Sea that the royal family did convert to Judaism after being visited by an Orthodox delegation, a Muslim delegation, and a Catholic delegation, and a Jewish delegation. They chose Judaism. But the majority of the Khazar people did not convert to Judaism. Now, some of them might have. They remained part of a pagan religion. And you know, they, they, uh, there's a lot of conspiracy theories about Ashkenazi being descended from the Khazars. There's no evidence of that. And I'll point to two. Y'all are. Y'all are. No, no, no. That's why y'all wear them yarmulkes and them hats. That hat, they ain't in the damn Bible. That hat, that, that's from the Russian steppes. That's from Jordan. No, Russia. that came from the Talmud. That's cap. That came, cap. yeah. That, you that's Talmud. You wear that's that Talmudic. hat. You actually have your head covered. You break that's the Talmud, No, that's Talmudic. That came from the Talmud, which just oh, comes from okay. both Palestine and, and Babylonia. It has nothing to do with the Khazars. God damn. Yeah, that's cat. When you when you put that on your head, your head is actually covered. You can't have your head covered. That ain't in the Bible. Them, them big hats y'all wear. That all you know why y'all wear that all black? Because y'all read Jeremiah 14 and 2 and said black into the ground. So y'all just wear all black. That's not it. That's not in the Bible. No, it's in the Talmud. That the became, Talmud is not the Bible, though. No, like, I didn't say it was, but it's, it's commentary you. on the Bible. Well, we established Those are customs that came afterwards. They came during the Roman times. But if we're establishing who the children of Israel are, the Torah supersedes Talmud. Of course it does. Thank you. So what you're saying doesn't match up with the Torah. You said you're a Jew by your mother. That's not the Torah. It's not in the Torah. And numbers, maybe it's, maybe it's Talmud. I mean, I, I don't know. It could be Talmud, yeah. but... Numbers Talmud one, is a continuation. Numbers, numbers, one eight, numbers one and eighteen said you grabbed them by the seed of their father, not by the mother. Well, they ain't no tribe of Dina. They ain't no tribe of Dina. They ain't no tribe of Leah. They ain't no tribe of no women. It's only yeah, but the women gave birth to the uh, sons of Israel. But the seed, like even in the story of Exodus, remember <clears throat> they wanted to slay the men. The baby, the male babies, the women right. babies to live because male babies carry the seed. Women baby carry whatever seed is implanted in them. Okay, look, I don't want to get into a Talmudic argument. <laughs> I, all I know is that conventional Judaism holds that the mother is, if the mother is a Jew, the child is a Jew. I think a lot of, and, and you know something, I think a lot of it has to do with proof of, of descent. Gotcha. Because when the mother gives birth to a baby, you know that that's the parent. 
you don't necessarily know who the father is. So my mama and daddy is a Jew. So you're going to get me up in there so I could be the prime minister? You have to go over with the rabbis of Israel. I mean, it's not up to me. Yeah, let's go. The only thing I want them to do, I do not take it up to the, Take it up with the rabbis of Israel. I don't, I don't want that Amoyo, though. I don't want that Amoyo no, practice. Wait, wait. You have to do, that's basic. You have to do that. No. <laughs> Are you talking about circumcision? Yeah, I don't want no man nibbling on my penis. No, no, no. That's hey, Oh, listen, that's, that's a bunch of bull. That's, there is this weird, wait a minute here. I want to answer that. <laughs> There's this weird cult, probably comes from the Sabadians, which was this subversive element in Judaism where you had people doing that. But that's not what they do, okay? That's 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 not what conventional Jews do. Yeah, I'm already circumcised. I don't need nobody coming to examine. Then I'm fine. You're good for it. Then you're good. Unless it's a lady. I don't want no man. <laughs> no, no, don't. That's crazy stuff. That's the weird. Right. Judaism has some some rather unusual and somewhat weird cults that operate within that's not conventional judaism they don't do that all right i think we're kind of good i don't know if there's anything yeah, else well but. okay there there was a super <laughs> chat and again i don't know this might be to stir, any comments from the chat to stir, yeah there's been a ton of comments in the chat throughout uh and anything I, good well Read yeah I, well i i i think some good if you guys want some questions uh here at the end send them in uh but revan said ralph can you throw them off by asking them to debate how the true basic God, like the word God is spelled, uh, was a super chat there. And that was a while back. Um, mm. So you guys can answer that if you want or, or not. But okay, that was a super chat. Captain, you want to take that one? Uh, can you say the question again? The word God is what? How is it spelled? In Hebrew or English? I mean, he didn't specify. He just said, how is it spelled? I, I w- I mean, I would think well, English. Is God is English is, yeah, the word God in English is just G-O-D. Well, how would you spell in Hebrew then? I think it's yud, yud, yud K Vav K. There are four letters. And even then, it's it's forbidden in Judaism to spell uh, pronounce the name. Yeah. Because it, it, it kind of anthropomorphizes God, right. turns God into a person. It has to be done because we don't know God literally as a person. God is beyond... It's, it's in the supernatural world, not the natural world. We are creatures of the natural world. And so we don't actually know God. We don't literally walk with God. Abraham did, but we don't. So we don't pronounce the name of God because that essentially defines and diminishes the totality and the mystery of the creator of the universe. Okay, but I, what, the reason why I said that when he said how it's spelled, God and Lord are two different things. Usually God can be uh, Elohim. Like for angels, or it could be the most high God. Lord, he said Yo hate Wave. We would say Yahweh. And we would spell it Y A H W A H Yahweh. I sure I got that right. So, so that's how we was, but uh, uh God could be Elohim or Alahim, depending on what type of what dialect of Hebrew that you speak. Or Elohenu. Yeah. What he said. Elokenu, as it were. But yes, but these are all euphemisms. They're not the actual name of God. You're not a lot we don't know the name of God. Only God knows the name of God. We can only we're only human. We we we're, we're images of God. Yeah, because even um, so like when the, when he, when Moses gave the name, he said, you know, Yahweh was my name. Um, so that's the name that we ascribe to the Most High. That's why most of the time I would agree with him on that. We don't just say the Lord's name. Right. Just to say it. We usually just say the Most High or God or something like that. All right, fair enough. And I think Moses, Moses came the closest to it when he said, when when he saw the burning bush, he said, God said, I am what I am. That was a cut though to Moses for asking for Moses asking that question. Who shall right. I? Say? Right, he wasn't. I mean, when I say cut, like that was him disrespecting Moses for even asking that question because he shouldn't ask that question. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now this has been an amazing conversation, by the way, uh, and I knew it was going to be good, but it exceeded even my expectations. Not even joined us. Yeah. Yeah. And Charles, I'm going to let since you started off. Uh, I'm gonna let you get your final thoughts first, and tell people where they can find you as well as part of the uh, your final bit there, and then I'll let Captain go, and then we'll adjourn uh, this okay. debate. Thank you, Ethan, as always, and thank you, Captain. You're a great intellect, and I really appreciate the conversation. Um, to just bring things back to the question of Gaza and the question of Israel versus the Palestinian Arabs, I would suggest that both sides make their case. Both sides have been locked in a civil war that has been bitter and has been intransigent 
going all the way back, I would simply argue that the Israeli Jewish side is the better and superior side on a lot of different levels, spiritually, politically, nationally, and otherwise. And that I hope that the Arab people can coexist peacefully with Israel and that both sides can benefit as sovereign, national, religious states who are trying to serve their own people. Kevin, take it away, sir, and thank you. And thank oh, you. and also oh. my book is available on Amazon. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. Uh, <laughs> now, Captain, you take it away, and I appreciate both you gentlemen uh, being here tonight uh, no and giving problem. us so much time. Uh, Captain, you've been here a lot. Uh, Charles, this is his yeah. second time, but uh, appreciate you both. Yeah, we could do a part two anytime, Ralph. You know, um, I love the platform. I actually bought your book, uh, Charles, mm -hmm. because I wanted to, When I, especially when I saw it was uh, just recently done, I think, in January. So I, I knew I would have like the most up to date information of like your thought process because everybody thinks differently. So I didn't want to talk to you like I'm talking to Rabbi such and such. I wanted to speak to you directly. That's why I got the book. Mm -hmm. So I'm Captain Zaria Gavashi, BK under command of Jenny Hanna. What I, I did love this dialogue. Um, it was very um, amicable, yeah. and I think it shows that we can have a conversation that even in our differences, it doesn't mean that it has to be um, crazy or wild. Um, I do think I showed where the genocide was at. <clears throat> And why there'll never really be peace there, because one person's solution is bloodshed. Another person's solution is submit or bloodshed. And neither one is going to, I don't think neither one is going to bend this. They've been going to war since the 1900s. When you do look at the history of it, so I don't see it never ending. And that's biblical prophecy because the land doesn't belong to either one of them. But again, like I said, good dialogue. I look forward to having more dialogues on your show, Ralph. Yes. Uh, whoever you get, you know, next, just let me know. Will do. Uh, it's been excellent to be on your show, and uh, that's my time. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir, and I appreciate those kind words. We'll definitely have you back, and we'll definitely have you back too, Charles. Thank you both right. once again here on the Kill Stream. All right, take it easy, man. Right. Thank you. All right, you gentlemen, take it easy. That was really good. I have to say, that was so good. And I know it broke up. Thank you for watching this clip by Colonel J. This is the King of Bold here. Remember to like and subscribe. Juice.